The Explanation Boom and Depression The boom-bust cycle is generated by monetary intervention in the market, specifically bank credit expansion to business. Let us suppose an economy with a given supply of money. Some of the money is spent in consumption. The rest is saved and invested in a mighty structure of capital in various orders of production. The proportion of consumption to saving, or investment, is determined by people's time preferences, the degree to which they prefer present to future satisfactions. The crucial factor is the pure interest rate. This going rate is reflected in the interest rate on the loan market. Now, what happens when banks print new money, whether as banknotes or bank deposits, and lend it to business? The new money pours forth on the loan market and lowers the loan rate of interest. It looks as if the supply of saved funds for investment has increased, for the effect is the same. The supply of funds for investment apparently increases, and the interest rate is lowered. Businessmen, in short, are misled by the bank inflation into believing that the supply of saved funds is greater than it really is. Now, when saved funds increase, businessmen invest in longer processes of production, i.e., the capital structure is lengthened, especially in the higher orders most remote from the consumer. Businessmen take their newly acquired funds and bid up the prices of capital and other producers' goods, and this stimulates a shift of investment from the lower, near the consumer, to the higher orders of production, furthest from the consumer, from consumer goods to capital goods industries. If this were the effect of a genuine fall in time preferences and increase in saving, all would be well and good, and the new lengthened structure of production could be indefinitely sustained. But this shift is the product of bank credit expansion. Soon the new money percolates downward from the business borrowers to the factors of production, in wages, rents, interest. Now, unless time preferences have changed, and there is no reason to think that they have, people will rush to spend the higher incomes in the old consumption-slash-investment proportions. In short, people will rush to re-establish the old proportions, and demand will shift back from the higher to the lower orders. Capital goods industries will find that their investments have been in error, that what they thought profitable really fails for lack of demand by their entrepreneurial customers. Higher orders of production have turned out to be wasteful, and the malinvestment must be liquidated. A favorite explanation of the crisis is that it stems from underconsumption, from a failure of consumer demand for goods at prices that could be profitable. But this runs contrary to the commonly known fact that it is capital goods and not consumer goods industries that really suffer in a depression. The failure is one of entrepreneurial demand for the higher order goods, and this in turn is caused by the shift of demand back to the old proportions. In sum, businessmen were misled by bank credit inflation to invest too much in higher order capital goods, which could only be prosperously sustained through lower time preferences and greater savings and investment. As soon as the inflation permeates to the mass of the people, the old consumption-slash-investment proportion is re-established, and business investments in the higher orders are seen to have been wasteful. Businessmen were led to this error by the credit expansion and its tampering with the free market rate of interest. The boom, then, is actually a period of wasteful misinvestment. It is the time when errors are made due to bank credits tampering with the free market. The crisis arrives when the consumers come to re-establish their desired proportions. The depression is actually the process by which the economy adjusts to the wastes and errors of the boom and re-establishes efficient service of consumer desires. The adjustment process consists in rapid liquidation of the wasteful investments. Some of these will be abandoned altogether, like the western ghost towns constructed in the boom of 1816 to 1818 and deserted during the panic of 1819. Others will be shifted to other uses. Always the principle will be not to mourn past errors, but to make most efficient use of the existing stock of capital. In sum, the free market tends to satisfy voluntarily expressed consumer desires with maximum efficiency, and this includes the public's relative desires for present and future consumption. The inflationary boom hobbles this efficiency and distorts the structure of production, which no longer serves consumers properly. The crisis signals the end of this inflationary distortion, and the depression is the process by which the economy returns to the efficient service of consumers. In short, and this is a highly important point to grasp, the depression is the recovery process, and the end of the depression heralds the return to normal and to optimum efficiency. The depression, then, far from being an evil scourge, 
is the necessary and beneficial return of the economy to normal after the distortions imposed by the boom. The boom, then, requires a bust. Since it clearly takes very little time for the new money to filter down from business to factors of production, why don't all booms come quickly to an end? The reason is that the banks come to the rescue. Seeing factors bid away from them by consumer goods industries, finding their costs rising and themselves short of funds, the borrowing firms turn once again to the banks. If the banks expand credit further, they can again keep the borrowers afloat. The new money again pours into business, and they can again bid factors away from the consumer goods industries. In short, continually expanded bank credit can keep the borrowers one step ahead of consumer retribution. For this, we have seen, is what the crisis and depression are, the restoration by consumers of an efficient economy and the ending of the distortions of the boom. Clearly, the greater the credit expansion and the longer it lasts, the longer will the boom last. The boom will end when bank credit expansion finally stops. Evidently, the longer the boom goes on, the more wasteful the errors committed, and the longer and more severe will be the necessary depression readjustment. Thus, bank credit expansion sets into motion the business cycle in all its phases, the inflationary boom, marked by expansion of the money supply and by malinvestment, the crisis, which arrives when credit expansion ceases and malinvestments become evident, and the depression recovery, the necessary adjustment process by which the economy returns to the most efficient ways of satisfying consumer desires. What, specifically, are the essential features of the depression recovery phase? Wasteful projects, as we have said, must either be abandoned or used as best they can be. Inefficient firms, buoyed up by the artificial boom, must be liquidated or have their debts scaled down or be turned over to their creditors. Prices of producers' goods must fall, particularly in the higher orders of production. This includes capital goods, lands, and wage rates. Just as the boom was marked by a fall in the rate of interest, i.e. of price differentials between stages of production, the natural rate or going rate of profit, as well as the loan rate, so the depression recovery consists of a rise in this interest differential. In practice, this means a fall in the prices of the higher order goods relative to prices in the consumer goods industries. Not only prices of particular machines must fall, but also the prices of whole aggregates of capital, e.g. stock market and real estate values. In fact, these values must fall more than the earnings from the assets, through reflecting the general rise in the rate of interest return. Since factors must shift from the higher to the lower orders of production, there is inevitable frictional unemployment in a depression, but it need not be greater than unemployment attending any other large shift in production. In practice, unemployment will be aggravated by the numerous bankruptcies and the large errors revealed, but it still need only be temporary. The speedier the adjustment, the more fleeting will the unemployment be. Unemployment will progress beyond the frictional stage and become really severe and lasting only if wage rates are kept artificially high and are prevented from falling. If wage rates are kept above the free market level that clears the demand for and supply of labor, laborers will remain permanently unemployed. The greater the degree of discrepancy, the more severe will the unemployment be.